I'm Thomas Turner. I'm an environmental economist from Sweden. I uh, work on the design of policy instruments. And for instance, I was involved in the IPCC as one of the authors in charge of the chapters on policy design. <laughs> This is a very large-scale problem. We're, we're playing with one of the parameters that determines Earth. Um, and so the trouble is we don't really know. Uh, there are probably multiple risks. There are a lot of things we know. Ice will, of course, melt. So we will lose the ice cover on the North Pole and eventually we will uh, lose ice cover on the South Pole and uh, Greenland ice sheets and so on. This will lead first to a small increase in sea level rise. Eventually, in, in hundreds or more years, it will lead to a gigantic uh, sea level rise. So, so that presents numerous problems for uh, very many cities around the world are located just at the sea level. So that's an obvious problem. We might actually have a, a century of two when there are no permanent sea lines, seashore lines. This will cause big costs for, for infrastructure, shipping and roads and so on. Um, then we would probably change the ecology of Earth with the movement of, of crops, animals, um, all kinds of insects, uh, pathogens, and this can change patterns of, of where it is good to live, where um, uh, crops will grow, where diseases will flourish, and so on. Uh, then socially this will create a pressure for people to move. It might uh, turn out it's better to live in Siberia than to live in India, but there's a very large number of people who then have to move in a relatively short amount of time with all the social implications of this. So there's, there's numerous risks. So it is really hard to assess the aggregate costs of climate change. Um, because we are uncertain what will happen, we can't really uh, give an exact number, but of course we still do our best. The scientific method is to base cost estimates on past experience, because uh, we, we can't theoretically derive what the cost will be, so we look at, for instance, how fast have warm countries grown in the past, with how fast have, have colder countries grown, and so on. But this is uh, only a partial guide to the, to the future. Uh, still, very recently, there is, I think just last week, uh, a new article published in Nature by Marshall and, uh, and two other authors. And they estimate that even, that there will be dramatic, they actually estimate costs of around 30% of GDP for three, four degrees of warming. But even for uh, one and a half and two degrees, they estimate that there is quite a large increase in costs going from one and a half to two, so that it would actually be a big benefit to stay at one and a half degrees compared to two degrees. And there I think they talk of an order of magnitude of 20 trillion dollars in aggregated costs. Uh, of course these numbers are, are uncertain. Uh, we're speaking of a hundred years of, of, of future development. We don't know quite what will happen or how fast it will happen. We don't know how well we would be able to respond with, with the help of new technologies and various adaptation mechanisms. So it's very uncertain. But there are certainly risks. Not only will growth be slower. We could take the case of, of Africa and, and, and India. There are many places where it is already very hot today places with, let's say, more than 40 degrees quite frequently. And if you are outdoors working in the fields, or if you are indoors working in a factory which does not have air conditioning, then you are already at the physiological uh, limit of what humans uh, really can stand. And, and hot days, uh, Indian economists have shown that on hot days, productivity falls. Even in industries like diamond polishing or steel manufacture, not just in agriculture, but in all kinds of industries, because it gets so hot that people just faint and uh, get ill and get uh, heart problems and uh, so So um, this is a major um, 
major problem, in particular perhaps for Africa. Most of the population growth is, is estimated to happen in Africa, which would go from maybe one to three or four billion people in the next uh, 78 years. If the, it was sort of Africa's turn to grow. Uh, in the past, first Europe and the United States grew, and then this spread to Latin America and Asia. And Africa is the only continent which has only recently begun to see a uh, lot of economic growth. And now, perhaps that will never happen, this growth, because, uh, because with the damages from climate change, simply the, the ability to grow will, will be severely damaged, and uh, there may not be growth. The consequences would be uh, a lot of human suffering, and, and of course, uh, political unrest, uh, pressure to migrate, and a number of other consequences. Another kind of cost is, is that of stranded assets, uh, which worries us in the, in the rich world and in, uh, in the financial markets, for instance. If we um, rapidly are going to transition, as we, we hope that we are, from um, fossil fuels to renewable fuels, then the, the, the value of um, assets in coal, oil and uh, other fossil fuels will fall. And that has already happened in the last uh, five, ten years. They have fallen quite a lot. So we can speak of uh, several kinds of uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to the um, um, hard science here. We don't know quite how fast warming will happen. We have a fossil record, and we can see we can see easiest back um, a million years, but it's very hard to see back several uh, million years. And we know that there there have been periods with very high carbon dioxide, as as we are going into now, um, many millions of years ago, and the sea level rise was sea level was uh, forty meters higher, and so on. But we don't know how fast this kind of transition will, will happen. Um, so there's uncertainty there. Another kind of uncertainty is, of course, about policy. We face, at the same time, two kinds of challenge. And we have an environmental crisis, but we also have a political crisis, which, unfortunately, is, is very evident today. When um, uh, leaders uh, who are really quite a, a threat to democracy uh, are being elected, in, in numerous countries. And um, so many of our calculations, of course, they assume that we choose the best path and that our response is optimal. But our response could be uh, inoptimal. Our, our, our response could make things worse. And if, for instance, one has the attitude that trade wars are uh, good and uh, easy to win, uh, then costs could escalate very significantly. On top of this, uh, there's a sort of a numerical uh, or ethical problem of, of aggregating costs. If we're talking about costs in the year 2100, we usually discount these to understand them today. And the science of discounting uh, is quite complex. Uh, it's actually one of my favorite subjects. Um, but there's no easy answer, because a uh, uh, trillion dollars in the year 2100 is not the same as a trillion dollars today. But which discount rate to use is, is not easily answered uh, and makes an enormous difference, actually. In the, in the Stern Review, which was one of the first big estimates of, of climate change, um, the biggest uncertainty was the discount rate. So, so that may, this single factor, the difference, as you know, between one or two percent in, in a hundred year perspective is, is dramatic. Well, strangely enough, by some sort of luck, we actually have a laboratory where policy instruments have been tested. There are some countries just like gasoline taxes and have had them for many years. Italy, in fact, is an example of this. They very early had uh, high gasoline taxes. And um, 
it may not be the case that this was because they really wanted to deal with climate change. Maybe they wanted, uh, they couldn't tax something else, and so they wanted revenue for the state. Whatever. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we have a, a natural experiment because some countries have had a high tax on gasoline and others have had a low tax. So we have a lot of price variation over uh, oh, 50, 60 years of, of experience and we can see what happens. And it shouldn't be any enormous surprise for someone trained, even moderately trained in economics, that when things are more expensive, people uh, use them more carefully and don't consume so much. So uh, this is exactly what happens, right? And basically the price of, uh, of uh, gasoline and uh, diesel and a few other fuels is about three times as expensive in uh, Europe and Japan than in the United States. There's also variation between years. So there's a lot of evidence we have, um, and there are hundreds, many hundreds of studies. I did a survey in... Um, back in 1990, my first survey of this, there were several hundred studies already then, and now there must be thousands of studies. There are many surveys, in fact. And they all point to the same um, result, that the gasoline taxes are quite effective, and, uh, and they lower demand. So in, in Europe and in Japan, we use much less fuel per person than in the United States, in spite of the fact that we have similar income levels. Uh, there are a few complications. Uh, the effect takes quite a long time before it materializes. So you raise the tax and uh, nothing happens the first month and then a little bit happens the first year, but most of the effect comes maybe after 10 years. So this is, of course, um, an important consideration. But still, the instruments work in the long run. The difficulty, however, is to get them implemented. Because there's a lot of uh, fine-tuning that needs to be done when you, um, when you change an instrument, when you tax carbon in a country, you have to trade off. There are some groups that win and they are pleased, and there are some groups that lose and they will complain and lobby. So you need perhaps compensating policies and you need a sort of a tax reform package. This is a complicated thing to do. The next complication is that you would preferably want to do this all, in all the countries of the world at the same time. That's a big coordination problem. So the idea of discounting if, is that we want to compare costs, say a billion dollars in the year 2100 to today. This, this is usually done with a lot of formalized economic mathematics. But um, I think I can explain the essence of this in, in human terms. A billion dollars is much more if you are poor than if you are rich. And so the value of a billion dollars cannot be neutrally assessed. It depends on our vision of the future. It depends in rather a complicated way. If we would be a lot richer in the future, then a billion dollars will not be such a big problem. But climate change may affect, in fact, our ability to grow. We might, in fact, even be poorer in the future. Then a given loss of a billion dollars would be bigger. And it's even more complicated than this because um, a billion dollars is not really just a pile of cash, but we are losing certain assets. And we might lose, for instance, agricultural land. Now, good agricultural land may be more scarce in the future. So the price of those specific assets may rise. And that is, is one of the many complications of discounting that we should take into account and that probably implies uh, that discount rate should be low, which means that we should take more seriously future climate change and already today do more to uh, stop climate change, in fact. So, um, we're speaking here of a market failure, so the market will not produce incentives of its own. We need some kind of regulation. Uh, there's also signs that regulation will in fact come, but we don't know if it will come fast enough. And it's also the case that um, uh, 
regulation is coming in sort of in patches and uh, so there are uh, several reasons why companies might want to take some uh, unilateral action. One of these could be ideological. Uh, there are some companies that would prefer to have less state intervention and so they want to somehow politically show that, that uh, business can solve this kind of problem themselves. And so you can sort of preempt legislation. If, if, if all businesses were to um, uh, clean up uh, and, and do a lot of abatement on their own, this would reduce the case for, for policy. You can also uh, perhaps affect the kind of policy because the policymaker has a wide uh, menu of instruments and a business could perhaps affect which instrument they would choose. And business would prefer some instruments to other instruments. Typically business wants the same instruments to be used in many countries and they prefer perhaps instruments with a certain amount of flexibility and uh, a reasonable cost sharing profile and so on. So uh, there are several reasons. In addition to this, there are the, um, the first mover advantage. If, you, uh, if your business uh, goes ahead and collaborates with the uh, authorities, sets a good example, then you're not only affecting the type of instrument and the timing of the instrument, but you are also ready for this uh, instrument and regulation when it comes, and you might reap uh, some advantages to this, and particularly if the regulation is spread also to other countries. The opposite sort of happens if you don't, and you're a latecomer, you resist, and then you're, you kind of have to adapt rather late, and maybe the instrument doesn't really suit your particular instrument, your particular industry, uh, then you uh, have the sort of stranded asset kind of uh, problem. So um, I think there are, all these are reasons for, for, uh, for private companies to, to want to be proactive. An additional one can be uh, corporate social responsibility and image and branding kind of issues. It, it, it may be good for your image with your customers, with your employees, with other stakeholders perhaps, um, that you are seen as proactive. of the insurability of climate risks is, is complex and there's probably uh, some risks that are hard to insure. Um, for a risk to be insurable you preferably want uh, a clear-cut event uh, to target uh, that you're insuring against. Something that is extremely subtle, uh, hard to describe and and develops over uh, many years, like, like various aspects of the movement of species, for instance, in response to change climate, is hard. There's no trigger event. Uh, there's, uh, there's no counterfactual. There's, there's, this is hard. Uh, for instance, if your country grows less fast than it would have otherwise, that's not like a fire. It's, it's, a fire is insurable, but um, less fast growth than you think you would have had otherwise, that's, that's, that's harder to insure against because it's not such a clear-cut event. Um, but uh, climate risks also will contain a number of clearly identifiable um, events that are insurable, like storms, um, fire, forest fires, um, similar uh, events that, that are sort of clear and uh, against which you can, uh, flooding is an obvious case in point. Um, and it's, there's probably a, a strong relationship between these two things because a country that does not have insurance even against this kind of event like, like flooding, for instance, in the case of a, a low-lying uh, country like Bangladesh, 
uh, ultimately a very large part of Bangladesh will probably be uh, drowned, in fact. Um, but, but on the way there, there would be flooding events. If you are not insured against those, then, then it's very hard to, to rebuild and to have any economic activity in Bangladesh because the, uh, uh, the elites will not have their houses and their businesses insured. And, uh, and we know that uh, low-income countries that have no insurance, they, in fact, they, they grow much less fast and uh, um, costs are, become higher. So, so this accentuates also the, the, the uninsurable uh, part. So insurance can play a very big role in, um, in, in a proper adaptation to climate risk. I think there's, there's two ways in which insurance companies can help mitigate uh, climate risk. One is through their core business and developing new ways of writing insurance contracts so that they uh, incentivize precaution, for instance. And the other is uh, through the um, uh, management of assets uh, and uh, in that case, um, again, um, supporting the development uh, and the reorientation of the economy, broadly speaking, away from uh, fossils to renewables, uh, encouraging adaptation and precaution investments and so on, uh, by the management of, of their assets and of, of moving out of the um, assets to be stranded into the assets of the future, the, uh, the, the renewables and efficiency investments and, and other investments that will be profitable in the future. Mm -hmm.